So we've talked a lot here um, about cover crops in the last couple days. I'm not going to get too deep into this. You've heard you heard so much about the benefits of this yesterday. Um, of course, there's a lot of soil benefits, erosion. There's a lot of things going on from the benefit standpoint. I want to really get into the, the pest side of it. If you dig through the literature, you can find a lot of information, and, and most of it, to be quite honest, is, is generally negative uh, when it comes to having weeds or grass, and essentially that's kind of what a cover crop is. Of course, it had beneficial properties as, as well. But it's not hard to, to, to find stuff in the literature that shows a negative relationship with insect pests and some kind of cover of some kind. One of the ones I'm going to highlight, I'm going to kind of pull it out just a little bit because this is one that can, can be really devastating. There's a complex of things that can happen in a, in a grassy field. And we talked a lot about the green bridge yesterday. I don't know if it was really fully explained what a green bridge is, but what that is, if you have anything alive growing in that field, cover crops, winter vegetation, or whatever, and you burn down late, of course there's pests potentially on that, on that crop, and it's green, and as it dies, if you burn down really late, the pest that is on that crop that is dying, or that, that weeds or cover crop in that field, your new crop that you planted is emerging, and those pests have nowhere to go, and they move over. That's what we're talking about with the green bridge. Pea leaf weevils, most of you probably have not encountered this, and I hope you don't, but if you're dabbling in cover crops, you need to remember this one. It's a weevil, and it's heavily associated with legumes. So if you have vetches, um, winter peas, any of those kind of things that are legumes in a cover crop, this is something you really need to be aware of. They can be pretty damaging. They have a very characteristic feeding pattern. So if you're planting in some kind of legume cover crop and you look at the leaves, the cotyledons or, or the trifoliates or whatever, and you see this etching, it's real characteristic. You'll know what it is. You'll see it around the leaves. You have pea leaf, we pea leaf weevils. And they can be absolutely devastating in a crop. This is some stuff, I think this may be one of your pictures. Don, is this your picture? They can cause 100% yield loss if you don't catch them. And it can go quick with the green bridge. And it can go really quick. If they move out of that cover crop and the numbers are high enough, the lagoon cover crop, and they move into those beans, they can cause tremendous damage. And they don't just eat the leaves off and they grow back. They eat the growing point and everything else out. Fortunately, for us, seed treatments work very well for us. So we use seed treatments on a lot of acres and going into a cover crop, that's going to be one of our, our recommendations for sure going forward, more so than any other situation to reduce risk. And that picture down in the middle is, is what the pea weevil looks like. They're, they're very small, but they can be quite damaging and they get in very, very high numbers. And a lot of times what you're looking for is in a bean plant that's really small or a cover crop that's flat to the ground, there's not a really good way to scout for them. You see that characteristic etching. If you did not have a seed treatment on that seed, you better take action pretty quick. But unfortunately, we've had a lot of situations where this didn't happen. Gus, I stole this from Arkansas. With the NRCS programs, of course, the, the adoption of cover crops, there was a big push. Uh, a few years ago, Arkansas planted a lot, a lot of cover crops, and pea weevils absolutely devastated a lot of those, those acres where there was not seed treatments. I can say the same thing for uh, North Carolina, and I think it's just important to use products where you need them. In the Carolinas and up the northeast coast, they're not so big of a fan of uh, seed treatments on soybeans, but then they adopted this new practice, cover crops. A couple years ago, they had a lot of problems as well where they did not have seed treatments on those acres. Now, for this pest, and a lot of pests there's not, but for this pest there, there is rescue treatments if you can be in there on time and find it. If not, you're going to replant situation. We found a few years ago in soybeans, at least for the state of Mississippi, and Trent Irby and all of us were working on this, and Nick Bateman, uh, who, who Gus mentioned earlier. You know, for us in Mississippi, our sweet spot, give or take, a week, I guess, on either side is April 20th. What we documented was every 
day after April 20th, we lost four tenths of a bushel per day from planting date alone. So if you find yourself in a situation where you didn't take the right precautions up front and you do lose that stand, not only do you got to start over, but you've lost that potential just from an agronomic standpoint that, that yield. So what I want to do is I want to give you just a, a glimpse of some of the stuff that we were able to do um, with this uh, with this project funded by the Soybean Promotion Board, looking really at pest infestations and, and cover crops and how they how they interact. The first one was was really was really pretty simple. We were we were trying to look at the different, you know, there's there's a lot of pressure on seed treatments. I don't know if y'all realize this, but there's a lot of pressure on seed treatments from the EPA, environmental groups. Some of our own colleagues actually, you know, up north, I don't think they quite understand our system down here. They don't understand why we would want to use a preventative measure before an insect is in the field. And it's mainly, I believe, honestly, because they're just not familiar with the pest pressure that we deal with in this, in this Mid-South region. But nevertheless, just in case one day that we did find ourselves where we did not have this option, we wanted to look into a few things and see if we could, uh, find some other things that would potentially substitute for a neonic seed treatment. So we had an untreated check. One of the things we looked at, and I think this question was asked to Adam Chappell yesterday, he doesn't do it, he has not encountered problems yet, but a lot of people do, and I'm still a fan of this if you're not using a seed treatment, but looking at a an application of maybe a pyrethroid with the burn down if you identify stuff in that cover crop before you when you get ready to burn it down so we had looked at that as a treatment of course we had our just standard neonic then we looked at a neonic seed treatment with a pyrethroid in the in the um, in the burn down application we looked at capture in infura just as an option it's a non neonic of course it's a pyrethroid by fentanyl we squirted it in infura that was one treatment and another thing the epa pushed us on a little bit a few years ago when all this was coming down about seed treatments was they just kept asking the pop the, the question why can't you just plant more seed why can't you just plant more seed and if they take some out you're still covered so we actually threw that treatment in there our normal seeding rate we were planting here was 110,000 per acre on a 38 inch row and we, we increased that up to 165. All right, to make a long story short, we didn't really identify a lot of insects in this trial. Uh, on average and our untreated, just all we can really do is look at the stuff that's above ground. We're not out there digging all this up. But we didn't really find a lot of stuff. We did we did actually have more in our untreated than our two neonic seed treatments or our capture in furra. This is a complex of pea weevils, three-cornered alfalfa hoppers, and bean, leaves, but, oh, bean leaf beetles. But overall, our numbers were actually pretty low. If you looked at the mean defoliation level, and again, there's not a lot you can measure in here when you're taking these kind of counts, but when you look at this, we didn't really have a lot of defoliation. Now, everything we did impacted defoliation significantly, but overall, it really probably was not that significant with 7%. Keep in mind, our early season defoliation threshold is 35%. So we didn't have a lot of big differences in insect numbers. We didn't have a lot of defoliation. So you say, well, we don't really have a, a whole lot going on there. But when you look at yield, and I apologize, this is his slides there in kilograms per hectare because that's how we got to present this when we go to these conferences. But what I want you to concentrate on is the three bars to the right. And this is something that I've said all along. Now what these three things got in common, statistically, the neonic seed treatment, the neonic with karate, uh, was the highest yielder in the test, uh, followed by capture uh, LFR and fur. So if you think about that, you say, well, we didn't have a lot going on. Why, might I, why am I seeing that difference? Well, those are the only three things in this test that had something going on in the soil. And this is what I've said all along about seed treatments in soybeans. And when people try to look at soybeans and say, well, we don't never really see enough to put, you know, when we're out there looking, we don't really see much, you know, in soybeans that are small. What we're not accounting for is what's happening below the ground. And I've, I've said this all along, and this data really backs it up. I really think that below ground insect uh, pest, you know, just that, that group of pests below the ground, and it's a whole complex of stuff, is probably paying a, a playing a bigger role and the yield differences that we see with these seed treatments in our area than anything you're seeing above ground with exception to the pea leaf weevil in some of those occasions. So that was our conclusion from that study. We didn't really see a, a, you know, a big help from the higher population, the foliar spray. It needed to be a seed treatment. And that's kind of what we've said all along. 
This was talked about some yesterday, and in hindsight, you always think of these ways you would like to do things a little different, but we wanted to look at that burn down time. And entomologists have always been on board. You know, we want four weeks clean before you plant. I know everybody don't do that. I know NRCS is pushing for an at plant and burn down, which creates the green bridge. And look, you, got, you can do what you want, but we've always recommended that, and essentially it starves the pest out. So we looked at six weeks, four weeks, and two weeks. And again, in hindsight, I wish I would have added that, that at planting uh, insecticide, but I didn't. We did not see any difference in those burn down timings as far as yield goes. Um, I took all these other slides out that show pest pressure. They were similar to the other ones. But at least up to two weeks, we didn't see any difference. I'm not saying I would advocate going out two weeks or so, but in this case, we didn't see a difference. Six weeks, four weeks, two weeks, it made no difference when it came to yield. Now, don't hang your hat on this. It was, it was the result in this study. When you look at uh, either natural, just winter vegetation or, or cover crops or just wheat, we did actually see a, a yield increase uh, or more yield where we did have a cover crop blend in this. I don't know if that always holds true, but it did in this situation. And again, here's our neonic seed treatment in this study. The main effects of seed treatment, again, was significant. And what we've always seen when we see these differences, on average, two, two and a half bushels. It's very consistent. We don't always see it, but when we see it, that's, that's what it is, and that's what it was in this trial. I've had a little timer up here, and, and it seems to not be working. How much time do I got? I, I'm doing good, right? When am I done? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. I'm going to try to go through this one pretty quick. This is one, this is a little different than the kind of stuff we do, but this is one that I'm more excited about than anything. And again, part of our job every day, myself, Fred Musser, Jeff, Don, Gus, all of us, is we're trying to defend uh, the recommendations we got, the uses for our products that we've got. And again, this, this neonic thing has been all over the news. One, you see these studies that come out, neonics, you know, slugs feed on the plants that have got neonic seed treatments, and then these big carabid beetles feed on the slugs, so neonics are killing predatory insects. And it just goes on and on and on. So we had this study design. And we had a bunch of different cover crops. I'm going to speed it up a little. But one of the things we're trying to do in this, we really wanted to look at the whole arthropod community that was in a soybean field in various cover crops with and without seed treatments. That was the goal of this study. We wanted to see what was going on in, in this study. We had six different cover crops. We rated the above ground stuff at the VC and R1 stage. In this study, Adam Whalen, the graduate student, actually identified the family 33,000 different insects. Now, a lot of those was in the same, the same family. Just real quickly, what this is on the y-axis, the Shannon Entropy Index, and that's a really big fancy word. All that means is the higher the number, the better if you're looking for diversity. That means the diversity within the families. So that high bar, Austrian winter peas, there was, a lot, there was more diverse species or families of insects in that crop than the other ones, than the, that cover crop than the other ones. So in other words, it supported a uh, more variable um, or more diverse population of insect families. So that could be good, it could be bad, it doesn't matter, but that's what, it, that's what this number is showing. And then vetch was, was second and then the, a cover crop blend. So again, the legumes seem to be really kind of playing into this more diversity in the arthropod community. Not gonna bore you with this a lot, but this is the major families that he identified. The first one was ants. Ants was probably the most prevalent thing we caught in these pitfall traps. Grillides would be like grasshoppers and crickets. The rest of those on going on down are beetles. This was just a measure of all the families that made up less than 1% of the things that, that he identified in total. All right, just getting into the meat of this. If you take all the cover crop stuff out and you go across cover crop and you get back to this neonic conversation where we had fungicide only treated seed and fungicide with neonic treated seed, if there was actually significantly more diversity where there was not a neonic seed treatment. So when you look at that, you go, well, you know, what does that really mean? Okay, so that we, we've hurt our diversity somewhat by having a neonic seed treatment. If you look at family richness, this just means the mean number of total families. So again, there was a difference. There was a lot more families or things going on from an insect standpoint where there was not a neonic seed treatment. But here's the rest of the story. Herbivores. If you break these out into herbivores and predators, herbivores, this is the stuff that we want to control with a neonic seed treatment. It's stuff eating on the plant, right? 
So we would expect those first two things because the neonic seed treatment is in fact killing a lot of the things that are eating the plants. So that's actually good news when you step back and think about this a little bit. So we would expect that. This is probably the telltale thing that I get out of this study that I'm probably more interested in than anything I've showed you before. So we've reduced the total number of herbivores where we had a seed treatment, but we did not significantly affect the predators. That is really good news, and it makes a very good case for us, at least from an IPM standpoint, in the use of seed treatments in our Mid-South region. And we'll use this data, I guess, in the, the coming years as we publish it and so forth to, uh, to explain what we're seeing in our Mid-South region.